called to order the November 18, 2019 business meeting of the Cincinnati Board of Education. We welcome everyone and request everyone in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic Thank you. Ms. Wagner, please call the roll. Mrs. Bates? Ms. Bolton? Present. Mrs. Bowers? Present. Mr. Davis? Present. Mr. Messer? Mr. Morosky? Here. President Jones? Here. Thank you. And I just wanted to make a comment. Um, uh, Mr. Messer is out of town. He wanted everybody to know that. And Ms. Bates had to leave early. She was here for the executive session meeting and uh, had a family event this evening, so she will not be here as well. So, okay, so um, I need a motion to approve the minutes from the, we actually have five, um, special meeting October 2nd, 2019, the business meeting October 2nd, 2019, special public meeting October 10th, 2019, the business meeting October 21, 2019, with the revision, that the motion to approve student achievement minutes were not carried as opposed, it was written that it was carried, so we need to make that change, but we can still approve that with that revision. And the business and work session meeting, November 4th, 2019. I so need a moved. motion. Oh, thank Second. you. Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved as presented. Okay, so moving into the, um, committee reports, um, we are going to uh, approve two set, sets of uh, committee meeting reports. Um, the board at its October 21 board meeting reviewed the October 3rd student achievement committee minutes and the motion to approve the minutes was denied based on a discussion regarding some of the action items. So, um, what we wanted to do was to present again a motion for student achievement minutes to be, re to be approved so that they can go on file as recorded. So I, what I want to do, and, and just to clarify, the motion has to be made by someone who voted nay or abstained. So they can make the motion and it can be seconded and when we open for discussion, I'm going to ask Ms. Bolton to explain kind of where we are in the discussion and what decision we made, and then we'll vote to approve the minutes recorded. Okay? So I need a motion from someone who either um, did not approve or abstained. I make the motion to accept the October 3rd Student Achievement um, Committee report. Okay. Is there a second? Second, if I'm allowed to. You are allowed. Thank you. All right. Discussion? Thank you, Madam President. Yes, we uh, on the Student Achievement Committee are happy to have this uh, be uh, resurfaced and hopefully approved this evening. Uh, I think the dialogue that occurred uh, took place based upon really some confusion as to action items versus uh, assignment items and then the role of the committee regarding the direction of, of the administrative liaison folks that are assigned to representative uh, board committee uh, committees. Uh, what we had uh, within the uh, student achievement uh, uh, minutes as was uh, introduced was uh, lengthy minutes, if you will, for a lengthy meeting that it also had 14 different action items and to my recollection there were a couple of them that uh, raised the issue uh, regarding whether or not we need to have things go through finance if it was of cost, or that are there some items that shouldn't be recommended for uh, action by the committee, they should instead maybe be forwarded to the full board. Uh, and so I think much of that di dialogue was uh, ultimately useful, uh, but the committee felt strongly to make sure that the public record 
reflected the work of the committee and the community people that attended and presented. So what I think was in, determined is that we are creating an ad hoc committee to review some of those uh, substantive and procedural issues that were raised in that open dialogue. And uh, so uh, I know uh, uh, Mr. Morosky and, and Mr. Davis and I are thrilled to be, have this back before the board and appreciate your motion uh, and second and, and um, hope for approval tonight on the stipulation that some of these items, uh, uh, especially the, the, the topics and issues will be referred to ad hoc. Yes, thank you for the clarification. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to accept the student achievement minutes to be filed as recorded. Okay, um, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Minutes are approved, and we look forward to hearing the report from ad hoc. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Mr. Davis, please present the October 17th Policy Committee meeting report. Thank you, Madam Chair. The our Policy Committee met on Thursday, October 17th. Uh, we approved, recommend, we recommended approval of a previous waiver that the board has already approved. We had a continued discussion on the district's child sexual assault procedures. I feel like we've talked about this, um, but I don't remember which meeting it was. Was it, was it at the last board meeting that we spoke about this? Yeah, couple, couple board meetings. Okay, well, I don't want to, I don't want to overly be repetitive, but um, the conversation was was strong, and Mr. Hoyne brung Dr. Williams and Emily Campbell to policy, and they also discussed the curriculum around um, child sexual assault. Uh, Ms. Campbell advised that uh, she was going to reach out to Superintendent De Deputy Superintendent Amat about the committee's request to inform the district's wellness committee about the need for professional development and sexual assault for staff and teachers. The wellness committee, the policy committee uh, suggested that the wellness committee take a look at the t current um, policy around sexual assault. It's a very serious subject, one that um, we hope to, one that's been raised by a parent of a kindergartner and one that we hope to uh, have addressed so that our, our children and our staff are are very well versed in regards to child sexual assault. Uh, we then went to discuss policy 5722, school sponsored publications and productions. Uh, you will hear a resolution in that regard later on tonight. Um, we addressed the policies that were prior, previously scheduled for review, 8650 transportation by district contracted vans, uh, which I believe you're here tonight, and 9,700 relationships with organizations. Uh, Mr. Mr. Johnson, the transportation director, then uh, asked us to table three policies that we had had on the agenda for some time for a later date, and we'll come back to that when transportation and the administration uh, feels that we are ready to, to address that. We did address transportation to students, and Mr. Johnson will update the committee on the space available information um, that was very much uh, a question of, of board member Bates. We have some policies that we'll review uh, this Thursday. Everybody's welcome to come to the policy committee Thursday, uh, 11 a.m. It'll be in room 1A. Uh, school board school is gonna come visit us. So we're gonna have the meeting in room 1A and everybody's uh, welcome. And, invited to attend. Our final uh, piece of business was the use of, of cell phones in the classroom. Uh, and Mr. Hoying, um, Mr. Hoying did advise the committee that we had a policy 51, 7, 5136, which is cellular telephones and electronic communication devices. And students were not to have their cell phones out during instructional time. Uh, these are the minutes as written, and I uh, present them for approval. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bolton, as chair of the Finance Committee, please present the October 17, 2019 minutes. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, as uh, is our custom on a monthly basis, we heard from our government liaison folks reporting to us any number, actually about two or three pages of uh, pending House bills that are of interest to us or might have an impact on the governance of the district. Those are included in our minutes. We also heard about a possibility of perhaps a shovel-ready, so to speak, opportunity for some funds regarding um, uh, state money for hopefully partnered efforts, possibly for facilities, and there was some discussion about uh, our relationship with the uh, Cincinnati Recreation Commission and then other opportunities we might have as well, and the administration was gonna be looking into some of that. Then we also had, as is our custom, uh, a significant uh, presentation, if you will, by Ms. Brooks, who uh, shared with us particularly the enrollment piece uh, for preschool promise and our preschools specifically, uh, which uh, and I think Mr. Messer and Ms. Bates were particularly interested in where we had particular enrollment, where there was not enough enrollment, and there she's gonna be reporting back on a continuing basis regarding that. And then also as part of finance, as well as the Student Achievement Workforce Development Committee <coughs> Council, excuse me, reports the financial aspects uh, of workforce development uh, to finance and the HR part of uh, Workforce uh, Development Council to Student Achievement. They are in the process and have already now drafted a redraft of the council's uh, charter and I think is pre have been presenting it to, to the administration. The administration's gonna review it, and then when that's uh, done, uh, that would be uh, sent back to the board uh, for approval. We had a report, uh, as you know, every um, uh, month by uh, Hector Polanco, who is the uh, finance manager for Preschool Promise, so that was an extensive report about some of their challenges and also uh, looking at the actuals of last year's budget and this coming budget. We also continued because it's an assignment uh, in our work plan, had another update regarding transportation and, and costs uh, from both uh, Mr. Johnson, but also from uh, Ms. Trimble Oliver as well uh, on on-time data. It was similar to the full board presentation that took place as well in our work session. Then the treasurer presented her monthly um, updates uh, regarding federal grants and state grants and the tuition assistance summary and preschool uh, promise as well. And then uh, also presented to the finance committee uh, the budget uh, building process timeline. And once again, uh, we began this discussion again and had the discussion regarding estimated date capa debt capacity uh, as that will influence our growth uh, strategy uh, moving forward. And then we had an extensive number of um, CRAs presented from the city, and that is the summary of the minutes of the Finance Committee uh, for this past month. I submit and hope for approval. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. And while you have the floor, could you please <laughs> present the minutes from the Audit Committee of October 23rd? Yes, we had at the, at the request both of the Internal Auditor and also the Audit Committee, which is a community committee of experts, that review with us and help us figure out uh, the best practices for our financial uh, house. Uh, they had, uh, they presented, if you will, for what we mean by a request for proposal, what's the process for RFPs that was presented, as well as the audit committee, the community audit committee, being particularly interested in also the transportation requests for information, RFIs. That also was presented, as well as uh, suggestions uh, from a work group uh, by the internal auditor and at least I think two members of the committee uh, the uh, revisions for the charters as was suggested and it was they were some significant ones as I recall particularly as it pertained to the role of the actual audit committee and members and uh, appreciate the treasurer's input on that then we had a number of the audit statuses and as always is the uh, life we lead, uh, we have more than a six or so audits going on in the district uh, at any given time, and so that status was reported by the internal auditor. What followed then, too, was a, again uh, the same information that the treasurer had presented uh, to the finance committee regarding not just the budget timeline, but all of her monthly uh, reviews, 
of the financial status for the district. We had a discussion about the abatement update uh, led by the treasurer. And then finally, uh, it was determined that we needed to have some reappointments to the audit committee as some of the terms are ending. And so uh, we have names to present for full board approval at some time. Thank you, I submit and hope for approval. Thank you. I need a motion to approve the policy, finance, and audit committee meeting reports. So moved. Is there a second? second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved as presented. Okay, so um, we have four presentations tonight, and we're actually switching up a little bit. Um, so, Superintendent, you want to introduce the Go Vibrant group? Yes. Um, so we are very excited that through a connection with board member Bates, we have now established a partnership with Go Vibrant. Uh, we're really excited about the work and the partnership and the opportunities that Go Vibrant has afforded our kids and our staff members. And I'm going to ask Josh Harden to come forward to um, make the presentation. It's a very exciting presentation. Thank you, Superintendent Mitchell, uh, Board President Jones, the board, uh, good to see you, uh, Treasurer Wagner. Um, I will be quick. Uh, I know there's a lot of presentations this evening. Um, first, I want to give a kudos. I know the board is uh, big on kudos, especially this guy over here, uh, to Taft High School, who won hey, the hey, TA. Hey, hey, what? Hey, hey. He's still in my kudos. Hey, he's the kudo guy first, and then TA. FT. <laughs> Uh, won the first uh, playoff game in the sport of football since 1993. Give it up again for Taft. Thank you. Um, so it's been a, a few years since I've been in the role, um, and in doing so, I uh, got out to a lot of schools, talked about a lot of different things, and wanted to implement a couple initiatives. First being the AAA pathway, focusing on academic success for student athletes and hope to present to that uh, later this year uh, or next year, uh, and the other elementary athletics. Um, so we'll go through uh, and just talk about the different pillars as related to the strategic plan. So first and foremost, student-centered. Uh, students always come first. Uh, we put in a lot of time and effort uh, to talking to our junior high and high school coaches about what was happening and not happening. And we just anticipated and found out that um, the, the kids uh, that, that got to them on the junior high level had not really uh, been coached or know how to be coached. Um, and so we thought if we implemented more opportunities in the fourth through sixth grade in our elementaries, that we would prepare our students for success. Um, so more opportunities in fourth through sixth grade, uh, support and resources for our schools and communities, uh, positive coaches and mentors, um, equipment provided by uh, donations and grants uh, and different funds, uh, and we'll hear more about that later tonight. And then healthy lifestyle. Uh, we, we know all the facts. We presented this to you uh, last year in regards to uh, the importance of physical activity on uh, our students. Uh, so more opportunities leads to a healthier lifestyle. And in addition, um, the safety component. Uh, all of our elementary coaches also uh, are required to have a pupil activity permit uh, and all the certifications required that we do on the junior high and high school level. The big piece uh, was being able to, uh, through the support of Superintendent Mitchell and the board, uh, bring on a athletics coordinator to oversee elementary athletics. Uh, we presented that last year uh, and Brent's just going to share a little bit on our numbers. Uh, and then we'll bring up our, our team from Go Vibrant. Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks, committee, for having us here today. Uh, this slide here, uh, elementary athletics optimization, uh, just kind of gives you an idea of you know, how the process works and, and what I do on a daily basis. Um, as Josh said, I'm the elementary athletics coordinator. Um, I identify, plan, and execute sport programming for CPS elementary students. Um, we have internal programs and we have external programs. So, um, internal programs are designed by our office. Uh, we provide you know, uniforms, coaches, referees, all that good stuff. 
And then we also have external programs, which are existing outside programs that we partner with uh, to provide support opportunities for our students. Um, and then the third component here is our school resource coordinators. Um, I look at these uh, employees at some of our schools as uh, athletic directors of, of the elementary schools. And um, I work with them extensively, and um, it's, a, it's been extremely um, you know, impressive uh, to work with the different resource coordinators at the schools and, and how we can um, you know, work together to provide that leadership to, to make sure our programming is solid and, and something that our kids uh, can truly benefit from. And then you'll see here, here are some growth numbers. Um, you know, this is my second year in the position full time. So in year one in the fall, we had uh, ABC soccer, um, which, you know, that had eight schools. Uh, we grew to 20 schools this year, um, you know, impacting uh, more <laughs> students there. And then with flag football, that was new this year, uh, very exciting. Um, you know, we had 15 schools do it. Um, it was great to see the kids work together on the field, work on plays together, and, and truly, um, you, know, you know, work as a team and, and learn some life lessons along the way. Uh, as we move on to winter sports, uh, last year with basketball, we had 14 schools. Uh, this year, we're going to 24 schools. Um, almost every single school will have both boys and girls teams participating. Um, so those numbers are increasing tremendously, and we're really excited about that. Um, you know, in terms of futsal, uh, we had 14 schools uh, last year, and we're looking to do 20 this year. Uh, Flying Pig Youth Program uh, is another great one. Um, that's an outside program that, that's had a program for a while, and, and we felt that it was great to partner with them um, to, to give our students, get them out running and, and being physically active. We'll have 10 schools do that this year. Um, and as we move on to spring, um, we've got T-Ball, which had three schools last year. We're looking to do 10 schools this year. Uh, track and field, which, which is one of my favorites. It's co-ed. You know, you got the different jerseys, um, you know, running against each other. The kids get really excited. Uh, looking to have 16, potentially 20 schools uh, for this school year with track and field. And then volleyball is a new one. We, we're looking to pilot that. Um, one thing our office always said is, is, you know, start small and scale fast. So uh, with volleyball, we'll have four schools uh, participating this spring. And we can't do it without our community partners. Um, activities Beyond the Classroom has been great, you know, specifically with the sport of soccer. Um, they had an existing program, and uh, I came in, and, and we just have worked together to really, you know, take it to that next level. Um, we've got Cleats for Kids, which is an organization that, you know, gets equipment uh, for our students, uh, you know, free of charge, which is incredible. Um, I'll load up the van. You know, at times my car was filled to the brim, probably wasn't safe on the roads, but um, it, it was good to get all that equipment and get it back into the hands of our students so that we can provide equitable opportunities. Uh, University of Cincinnati Sport Admin Program, you know, they bring in, um, you know, students that are interested in sport administration and a career in sports. Um, they are heavily involved in our office each and every year. Uh, the Reds Community Fund, they impact on, on so many levels. Um, elementary, junior high, and high school through the sport of baseball and softball. Uh, Good Sports is another organization that I'm constantly working with because they have, you know, equipment that they can donate to our programs. Um, and then Gatorade, which has been great, um, providing, you know, resources not only for practice but for game day as well. Uh, let's take a second to give it up for our great community partners here. Like Brent said, there's no doubt that we couldn't do what we do without all of the community partners that we've uh, that we have now and we're building and growing with. Uh, one of those community partners uh, came to us around this time last year. Uh, board member Bates approached me uh, after a committee meeting and said that we have a great community partner. She's also on their board. Um, they want to do great things. They've been out in the community um, promoting healthy lifestyles uh, and they want to give back to the elementary schools and see how we can grow and impact athletics on the elementary level. Uh, that is Go Vibrant. Uh, Go Vibrant and their team, um, uh, we, we sat down, we had many meetings and talked about how we could truly impact uh, the schools in, uh, in our district. And um, uh, they had big visions and we had big visions and so uh, the partnership was just a natural. Uh, they, they certainly talked the talk and have proved that they, uh, they walked the walk. Uh, we had a great field trip um, and it ultimately ended up in the opportunity to receive um, a $10,000 donation uh, from Go Vibrant to impact the 10 schools up on the screen. Uh, they'll introduce uh, soccer, cross country, and track and field, and we're looking forward to uh, the continued growth of our partnership with Go Vibrant. Uh, before I call them up, I'd love to take a second 
uh, to watch a quick video uh, to show you what the field trip looked like and tell you a little bit more about uh, the donation. Having a good time? Having a good time? Woo! Oh, man. Uh, here today at uh, Smale Park, uh, downtown Cincinnati, for a fantastic <laughs> fundraiser. We partnered with Go Vibrant, and uh, uh, leading into the Blink, it's a program called Bounce. Uh, so as you can see the big uh, ball here, bouncing all the balls to show the fundraiser that we have with our friends at Go Vibrant. Through this fundraiser, we were able to have a field trip for 200 CPS elementary kids. 20 kids from 10 schools. Those kids don't realize it yet, but later today, we're gonna be talking to them about a $10,000 donation from Go Vibrant. I appreciate their support and their help and the impact that they're gonna make in elementary athletics in Cincinnati Public Schools. This is amazing. What are we doing? Oink! 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 What? We jump higher to you. Josh Harden and Mark Jeffries are, you know, such fun people to, to work with. So, yeah, it was kind of an easy job bringing them together, getting uh, the superintendent and her administration uh, on board. And, of course, the Board of Education is in full support. You know, people who want to help our kids, we're all in. So one of the things that we want to do is to encourage, as I mentioned, uh, children as well as adults to be active. Um, and so we partnered with CPS um, as well as our sponsors, PNG and Kroger, um, to raise money to bring athletics to elementary schools. So all of us know that often high schools have great athletics, right? But a lot of elementary schools don't have a lot of that same opportunity. So we're focused this year on bringing soccer, track, and cross country to 10 different schools. So there's plenty of other opportunities. So we look forward to doing this in the years ahead to continue it and expand not just from those schools but to other schools as well as other sports. Many years ago there were massive cuts to athletics at the uh, elementary and junior high level and it's taken years to get back to the place we are today. What Go Vibrant is doing with the fundraising and the balls is giving us such a huge boost and giving our kids a real advantage. I'd like to invite up our team from Go Vibrant, including um, founder Mark Jeffries and executive director Laura Chrysler. Thank you. We'll take two, only two minutes. First of all, thank you to the board. Thank you for Laura Mitchell as well. Uh, I want to first thank our partners at PNG and Kroger um, for all of their support because we can't do this without our uh, without our partners. I can't pass up the opportunity to make a fun pun in front of the Board of Education of the old adage one plus one equals three on partnerships because I know that's bad math, um, but it's truly the case. I mean, uh, it is phenomenal to partner, and Josh is just an amazing partner and uh, just proof that you can do a lot more uh, when you come together. And so thank him for that. And uh, thank you for all of your support. And we have a little check to present. So,
Thank you. And so before you leave, I want to ask if board members have questions or comments. Board members, do you have any questions or comments? Ms. Bowers. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Harney. How are hey, you? Ms. Bowers, good to see you. <laughs> this is very, um, very nice. I, I think I remember um, the um, founder of Go Vibrant coming to a SAC meeting. Is that correct? Yes. I, okay, yes. that's what I remember. The question I do have, thank you for the presentation. I'm so excited for our students. Um, the 10 schools that were selected to receive the $1,000, are there any of the schools that are currently res uh, participating in the fall and winter and spring sports? Are these additional 10 schools? Um, so they, they would, since fall already occurred, um, they were participating in that fall sport. So we had met with Go Vibrant and knew that those funds were coming, and so we identified them early. Does that answer your question? Um, On the fall side? Identified. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm trying to think, so I'm thinking of the sports that they were doing. But okay, so I'm thinking the track and the cross country. So the cross sport. country and track um, uh, will be in the spring. In the spring, okay. Yeah. Okay, other questions or comments? Um, I don't know who was first. Go Mr. Davis and then Ms. Bolton. I, you know, um, I just want to say thank you uh, to you two more than him, but you, I know who do the work. <laughs> I'm deep in the office. I got everybody cell phone. No, I'm serious. Hard Josh, workers, no doubt. Josh, I, uh, I've got a tremendous amount of respect for the work you guys are doing. Uh, Rockdale plays Thursday at 4.30, so Ms. Bolton will have to keep her Student Achievement Committee meeting <laughs> to, to a minimum so I can get to the game. Everybody's, everybody's invited to come to Rockdale uh, Thursday at 4.30 to see a guy in a red wheelchair coaching sixth grade boys and girls. Um, the work that's happening across the district is fascinating. These I'm talking about the elementary initiative. I've spoken enough about AAA Pathway, and you know how I feel about AAA Pathway. I think it's revolutionary. I think it's something that other districts should uh, look into. I think it's something that uh, it's, it's such an opportunity for our kids. But the elementary initiative, I, I want to give uh, additional credence to the work that you're doing around elementary, because I'm seeing it myself with my own eyes and my own hands, and how just how important it is. Uh, the cross country piece is huge. Uh, although North Avondale won our little cross-country league, that's okay. <laughs> Rockdale or South Avondale will we'll win next year. Um, the basketball piece is huge. The volleyball piece, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know if we're one of the first schools, but it doesn't matter because if it's happening on the west side of town, we're filling it on the east side of town, and that's what, that's what really makes a difference. And I, I hope, um, and I'm a little long-winded because I only got two more months on this mic. Mm -hmm. So I hope that the district can be more in tune with the geographical work that's happening inside of sports. I think it's an opportunity because I'm not certain we're making that mix. And it's, it may not just be in sports, but that's where I see it. It also could be in extracurriculars in other ways, but the geographical mix of how our kids are moving could be a better asset for the district in regards to some of our other conversations around growth, around culture, around how we uh, develop the school, the school mix. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of things that I see inside of sports could be much more useful. I don't think they get the kind of um, use that they could. And I, I'm encouraging the district uh, to really go further into how we utilize our athletics to make our schools better. And I want to say c congratulations to you, Josh, a former player of mine, mm. uh, someone I've known since they were 12. And uh, I'm so proud of you. And I'm so happy that you guys are such uh, good partners uh, and good colleagues to, to Josh, because we really do depend on you in the community. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Bolton. Yes. Um, I. I Fascinated by the, the geography piece, we need to talk more about that. There's so much about this district that really is a geographical question, uh, bringing the district together and what have you. Thank you so much for the, particularly the elementary initiative. I think it's so important, uh, not only that our coaches and our high schools have feeder systems, but more particularly, it's, it's very similar to the SCPA experience where so many children at SCPA 
have had over a number of years private lessons. And when they come to SCPA, they have that raw talent, but many of them have not had the private lessons. So at SCPA, they have to figure out a way to balance that. And, and that's an equity issue. And what you do in our elementary initiative is really an equity issue for our children. Not just that it makes our high school stuff better and bigger and stronger, but that it's an equity and an opportunity for our little people to actually have this experience that they're all having if they were living in the suburbs. Uh, so it's, it's great, and thanks to whoever's helping facilitate that. The other piece is I'm fascinated also by what you said about the resource coordinators at some of the schools. That's a, that's a whole other way of me thinking about that uh, need for a community learning center. So great. I love it. I think it's fabulous, and, and we have to um, always make this a priority. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Chair, can I say one more thing? Yes. Um, Mark. I'm sorry. I was so busy praising Josh and his, and his team. I did not want to m miss saying thank you to the work that you're doing. Go Vibrant. You can't go across Avondale without seeing Go Vibrant walking routes all throughout the neighborhood. And, and being able to get inside the district and building inside the district is something I wish other uh, nonprofit partners could really see an opportunity to. And you, you're leading the way in that. And I, I, I'd be admiss, uh, remiss if I didn't say thank you you know how much I appreciate you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and just in closing, um, we, we actually revised, uh, not revised the agenda, but the order at the request of Ms. Bates because she wanted to be here being the, the person that you all have been working with. Yeah. And, uh, and we had an extended executive session meeting, so she had to leave. But I'm sure that speaking on her behalf that she would be very proud of the work that has been done and she has expressed so much thrill and joy in, in what has happened. And so on for her, I say thank you, so. Absolutely, thank you. All righty, thank you. Okay, Treasurer Wagner, I believe you're introducing the next presentation. <clears throat> yes, I'd like to invite Jason Cook up to the podium. Um, Jason is a controller for Wilberforce University. He's here tonight representing the GFOA or the Government Finance Officers Association um, and to present the district with an award on financial reporting. So welcome, Jason. Welcome. Thank you all for having me. Um, Superintendent Mitchell, uh, Treasurer Wagner, um, I'm honored. I appreciate you having me here this evening on behalf of Ohio uh, Government Finance Officers Association to uh, present the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting to the Cincinnati Public Schools. Just a little background, um, this program has been in operation since 1946, um, and the purpose is to encourage and assist uh, governments uh, Mr. to prepare. Cook. I'm sorry, can yes, you speak up just a little bit or raise the mic up? We want to make sure everybody in the audience hears you as well. I Thank apologize. You. That's okay. Is that better? No, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, the program is uh, designated to try to assist governments uh, to prepare financial stamp, um, reports of the highest quality uh, for the benefit of citizens and other parties uh, with a vital interest in the government's uh, finances. And during the last half century or more, the program has operated. It has gained widespread recognition as the premier indicator of excellence in governmental accounting and financial reporting. What Cincinnati Public Schools had to do to earn this certificate, uh, they had to substantially conform to the program's demanding criteria uh, which goes well beyond the minimum requirements of generally accepted accounting principles. Um, the program participants, they submit copies of their comprehensive annual financial report to the Cert Certificate of Achievements program for an in-depth review and evaluation by at least two members selected from an impartial panel of government finance officers, independent certified public accountants, educators, and other specialized expertise and experience in governmental accounting and financial reporting. They're also reviewed and evaluated by members of the GFO, GFOA's professional staff, 
and only those reports that are judged by all reviewers to have substantially met the program's criteria are awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. I'm sure this is not the Cincinnati Public Schools first um, award that they received, but what it does, it reflects the professionalism and commitment of numerous individuals as well as many hours of hard work. It also reflects a high degree of dedication and leadership on the part of the Cincinnati Public Schools elected officials. The Government Finance Officers Association hopes um, that this award to the Cincinnati Public Schools uh, will serve as an example and encourage others to strive for the same high standards in their own financial reports. And therefore, it is my privilege on behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association to recognize Cincinnati Public Schools for the Certificate of Achievement of Excellence in Financial Reporting. So congratulations. I don't have the, the, the um, award with me. It's already been um, sent down to Mrs. They actually, uh, you, they actually mailed the award to my office, and it's upstairs. I forgot to bring it downstairs <laughs> for tonight. <laughs> so thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And I would like um, to ask the board if they have questions or comments. Um, we, we are always honored and, um, to receive such an award. And uh, our um, chief financial, financial officer, our treasurer, always works hard to improve our practices within our district. So, uh, do board members have questions or comments? Ms. Bolton? Uh, congratulations to everyone that makes that possible, and congratulations to the leadership that makes it be a facilitated and comprehensive effort to uh, always seem to get this award. Mm -hmm. So, it's, uh, it's not a one-time experience, so uh, that's a tradition of excellence, so congratulations. Thank you. It's a huge team effort, that's for sure. So. Yes. I will extend your congratulations to the department. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay. Superintendent, would you introduce our next speaker? Absolutely. So this is a time of year that we begin, quite honestly, our budget process for the next school year already. And so it begins with student projections. And so Sarah Trimble Oliver, our chief strategy officer, will come and talk about the process that we're going to be using as it relates to um, projections for our students in terms of enrollment, which then leads into our budgeting schedule and process. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so I have a short presentation on student enrollment and projections. And uh, this presentation will directly inform our um, strategic goal number five, growth, um, in which we state that we are our community's first choice for education. And uh, we would measure that by an, a net increase in student enrollment and increased market share. So uh, to continue our trend over the past few years, we um, have seen an increase in enrollment. Um, this is a, a snapshot of enrollment that we take um, every October and then compare year to year. Um, I can get you hard copies, Mr. Davis, no problem. Uh, so. The exciting news is um, our enrollment has increased again to 36,366, um, which is 84 students over projections even. Um, and so you'll notice this is the eighth year in a row that we're seeing increased enrollment. Um, and we, so this is an, a net increase of 553 students. And you will see that that is a larger increase than the prior two years even. So um, a net increase for um, CPS schools, um, we are seeing a net decrease in charter schools um, and non-public schools this year. Um, and the charter schools actually um, have seen, if you look at this data, an 18% uh, decline in the past four years. Um, we have those seen an increase, as you'll see on the chart, an increase in the number of Ed Choice, Peterson, and Autism scholarships. Um, so our net increase of 553 students this year um, does include um, 142 net new preschoolers. 
So, um, which the goal for that was 177, but I know that uh, Vera's team is still do processing those enrollments. So uh, what that means for our market share is that we have gone up to 68.5% market share. And if you remember, this is a direct um, measure in our strategic plan. Um, one interesting note is that we did um, end up restating the formula for how we calculate market share. Um, we removed the preschoolers because um, really K-12 was the most re reliable calculation of market share, the, the most reliable calculation of school-aged children in Cincinnati, and so we felt like that was a more reliable measure. So if you happen to look back at the strategic measure, it looks like we already have beat the, the market share. Uh, measure, but we're going to be restating that measure um, to be fair. So um, a quick demographic comparison. Um, no huge changes in our subgroups. Um, we did see a decrease in our economically disadvantaged subgroup, 1.1%, and an increase in our student disabilities uh, subgroup of 0.9%. So where are we seeing the most new students in Cincinnati? It's the same three zip codes as last year. Um, so this represents um, the Cheviot Westwood area number, is number one, uh, the Price Hill area is number two, and Western Hills is number three. And those three zip codes combined um, account for 33% of all the new students incoming to the district. So this is another visualization of all of the students um, that, are, that are new to our district this fall who were not enrolled last fall. And this is the representation of, of kind of the density. Um, and you'll see the, um, the red areas are really just showing high, high density of new students um, who are brand new to the district. And those are Westwood, East Westwood, West Price Hill, Western Hills. You'll see a, um, a red area in Winton Hills and in Mount Airy. So turning to projections for next year, um, as Ms. Mitchell mentioned, this is the first step um, in starting off the budgeting process. So uh, what we do is we take uh, three years um, history for each school in each grade and calculate the survival rate of students returning to the next grade up. Um, and, and we use that, put that into an algorithm and um, make enrollment projections for next year. So we are projected to grow another 496 students next year. So that concludes the presentation. Wow. <laughs> okay. Do board members have questions or comments? Mr. Davis. It's quick, quick calculation. So we're projected for our week. Do we see the trend of 33% of those new enrollees still coming from the west side of town? Is that, is that our, predict our prediction? Um, in as much as that this is the second year in a row since we've been measuring my zip code, it's the same exact three zip codes. So, yes. Do we know, like, what grades they are? We can definitely um, tease it out that way, yes. I just wanted to thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bolton, did I see your hand? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I got a little confused about which numbers you believe we should be using, and that so you're kind of resetting the strategic plan. Could you repeat that? It got a little yeah. So um, we did change our formula on how we calculate market share. So our market share is um, with our new formula is at 68.5. Um, which, if you go back and look at the strategic plan, right. it looks like we already met it, but that was because um, that was the old way of calculating market share. So we are, we're going to have to restate our measures using the new formula. And why did we change the formula? Uh, well, we realized that our old formula of market share was in, uh, counting in preschool, but we really don't have an accurate way to, of capturing the denominator like how many preschoolers live in the city of Cincinnati the same way that we do for K-12. So we decided it would be uh, most accurate to remove preschool from the formula. I, I totally understand and I certainly trust your judgment on that. I, I, I'm really beginning to wonder what that number of preschool is because we will in months ahead have to be deciding something about preschool promise and the $48 million renewal, 15 of which is preschool. 
it, we have to somehow have a better understanding of what the saturation is or not, or who, how many of those kids are really out there, and how many families really want their children to attend preschool, because it, 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 it's going to impact what we do. So I'm, I'm glad that you're drilling down on the, uh, or appear, apparently are trying to, because uh, you're big brain and, and that's what you do. Uh, but uh, we really need to know that. I mean, even the RAND people couldn't figure it out. They would have numbers for Hamilton County, they'd have numbers for this or that, the city, but they wouldn't have the numbers for our district. Some people in the audience may not know our district is bigger than just the city. So these numbers, we've got to have good numbers of what and a, and a degree of predictability about this preschool piece, three-year-olds and four-year-olds. And, and the other piece, I think following up on what Mr. Davis said about anticipating continued growth on the west side, so much is happening on the east side, whether it's 600 new units uh, in, around the Oakley area, all the kinds of things that are happening in Madisonville, I mean, we may really want somebody to get a better handle on that because that's going to impact whatever growth plan you all and we all come up with. But thank you for the, the preschool piece. I, we've, got to we've got to know how many kids there are that are in the market for preschool. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, Ms. Trimble, I will, Oliver, it would be great if we could get a hard copy sent yes. to us. Yes. Thank you. Right. She's trying to do that IT stuff with us. <laughs> she hasn't left Ms. that in the other office. Miss Wagner. <laughs> Hard copy. Get me up there. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. It is my pleasure today to present to you the fall forecast, five year forecast. Um, So just uh, for the public's advocation and a reminder to the board that every school district in the state of Ohio is required to file a general fund five-year forecast twice a year. It used to be in November and May, and they changed it this year to be a little bit later in November. I'm sorry, October and May, and now it's November and May. Um, and so we're required to file with the Ohio Department of Education by November 30th. <clears throat> so you will have a copy in the treasurer's report. Um, and much to give me a heart attack, when I looked at the version of that tonight, it was all put in red because it was an addition to the, a revised treasurer's report. It does not mean that we're in the hole. It just, pretend like it's not red ink. So <laughs> I had a heart attack when I saw that. Um, anyway, so every school district uses the same format. We follow the same rules. It's not based on a cash basis. And um, we pr produce three years of actual data and five years of forecasted data. So the factors that influence the forecast are a little challenging this year because we no longer have a state foundation formula. We are frozen at fiscal year 19's revenues. Um, and then they added a couple things to help us out. But so there's really no formula to follow. The state changes the budget every two years. So in a five year cycle, we'll have three different budgets to deal with. <clears throat> Makes it very hard to predict what that budget's gonna look like in three years. Um, we're no longer relying on district wealth. We we're frozen at the, 40, uh, the state share payment of 47.9% um, in their foundation formula payments. <clears throat> and the revenue growth that we were capped on last year, which lo we lost $5 million because they prevented our revenue from growing so fa as fast as our enrollment was growing. Um, they are now replacing that with what's called the enrollment growth supplement. Um, this year is about a million dollars. <clears throat> and they are still continuing to do pass-through funding. So if you recall, our charter school, our voucher um, students, um, the autism and Peterson scholarships, um, all revenues come to us and then it gets deducted off of our foundation payment to the total of about $76 million a year. <clears throat> and then throughout the forecast, just depending on the, which topic, we um, expect expenses to grow either 3 to 5% in inflation rates. So a brand new thing that made this forecast so much more challenging was the student wellness success funding. So this year, we're, we are anticipated to receive $8.6 million to support student wellness and success um, expenditures, and $12 million next year. 
So we've been working with um, Ms. Bunty and Ms. Murphy and her staff and to try to have determine how we were going to spend this money. So very recently, the rules from the state came out and they told us that we cannot include this money in our general fund, that we had to set up a totally separate fund to do this. So not only do we have to receive the revenues in a different fund, but we had to move our currently budgeted expenses that qualify out of the general fund into this special fund. And so that took a little bit of work. Um, and I anticipate probably during the budget presentations so that we'll start getting into more details on that. So here's the big picture. Bottom line is that um, we're sitting in a, in a pretty nice cash balance um, for the next four years. Um, if you recall in May, we forecasted hitting a cash deficit given the level of spending that we were forecasting in between the years of 21, 22, and 23. And so because um, of the way we've been managing our money and our growth, um, and um, our deficits being pushed off another year. And we have complete control over this. Remember, we'll have a, a new state funding formula, and we control the way we spend our money based on our budget and our appropriations. So um, given the last two years of the forecast is really, um, even though it looks scary, it's under our control. So <clears throat> here's a picture of the forecast um, of just the revenues in the general fund. The color codes are significant in that the blue bottom section of the forecast, I'm sorry, of the chart, um, represents the state foundation payment. So you can see a little bit of a trend upward based on our enrollment. The orange um, is our other funding revenue, which is what the, where the pilot payments go, the TIF payments. Um, the gray box in the middle was the $65 million renewal levy that we just passed. Thank you to the public for supporting us. The yellow block represents the $48 million rev levy that's coming up next November for renewal to support $15 million as a preschool expansion. That's what the red star means, is when that money will run out. <clears throat> and then the blue block, a light blue block above that, it represents the $51.5 million levy that we passed two years ago, and it's going to come up for renewal in 24. Um, the green section represents all the property, the continuing levies on property taxes. So the first three years are actuals. Um, <clears throat> so you see, okay, my light's not working, but the, the difference between 2019 and 2020, it shows like this tiny little dip. That's where we took the $8 million student success money out of the revenue to put into a different fund. <clears throat> and so you see that two years, we're gonna take that money that we're getting over the next two years, we're allowed to carry it into the third year, so we're trying to make really wise decisions about how that money gets spent because those spending items will come back to the general fund in the third, fourth year. So we're trying not to do anything that's gonna make it horrible for us to absorb back into the general fund. Conversely, the, you can see the slope of the expenditures goes up a little bit faster than our revenues. And that's simply for a couple reasons. One being that in the inflation cost just assumes that it's gonna continue it throughout the year, over the next five years. Um, and we get a little bit more accurate the closer we're in on our forecast than the farther out we are. The big dark line in the middle represents when the new formula will kick in, and we're hoping that it'll be the Cup patterson fair funding formula or some version of that. Um, that's also where we anticipate the student wellness money to go away, um, and when those, those expenses will come back to the general funds, that's why you see a larger increase between 21 and 22. <clears throat> So as a summary to the forecast, um, this shows the lines at the top, the orange line and the blue line represent the revenue monies as we go forward, assuming the orange line assumes that the next two renewals will pass. And we're pretty confident that we'll continue to get public support to do that. Um, the gray line represents our expenditures if we continue to spend at the rate that we're spending. And we know that this year was a big investment year to, to kick off our strategic plan and that we won't be seeing that level of budget increase going forward. <clears throat> um, the bottom two lines represent what happens to the cash balance between the levies that renewal, assuming that they renew the blue line, you can see we don't get into a deficit situ cash situation until 23. And then if we don't pass one of the, the next levy, it drops to the year before that. So the factors that aren't in this forecast are three things. Um, we're getting ready to enter uh, negotiations with our collective bargaining units, so we've not made any, any estimates in that respect. 
We haven't finished negotiating the tax abatement agreement, so there's no changes in that respect. Um, and then we haven't finished the capital version of the growth plan, and so there's nothing in the forecast to do that as well. So with that, I'd like to entertain any questions. Questions or comments? Mr. Morosky. Thank you, President Jones. Thank you, Treasurer Wagner. Um, only question I have right now, I think, is with the, um, and I know we had talked about this in passing before, the student wellness and success funding. Um, the way I understand it, that can also be used for mental health wellness. Um, and when do you think we would have um, recommendations for what that will be spent on? Because we don't have that yet, do we? So we have a we have a draft plan amongst a small team of us that have been working on it with okay. Ms. Bunty, Ms. Murphy. We haven't finalized that yet, um, but soon because we're going to have to start building the budget for next year as well. Okay. Uh, we, I just had to use some kind of estimates in the forecast, sure. but there are things like the the city nurse contract qual would qualify. Yeah. It's 1.6 million dollars that we could take out of the general fund and use and out of this money. Yeah. Um, some of, some of the school social worker works that the expansion that we did. Um, some of the resource coordinator expansions that hit the general funds. But there was also some new social emotional work that uh, Dr. Bunger and Ms. Bunty are working on that will be in, in that fund as well. So right. we'll bring you some more details soon. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Ms. Bolton. Just a couple. Um, thank you for saying that about the investment that we made uh, in this uh, fiscal year 20 because of the strategic plan that kind of increase in the budget, uh, as, as you well stated, can't continue as a trend for some obvious reasons. Um, wanted to ask also um, the things that aren't included, uh, I think are, are all big ticket items. Uh, so I'm concerned about that. Nowhere on here are we talking about any requests for new money. Is that correct? They're That's all correct. renewals? So that's also not one of the things that is part of this five-year plan. Well, one of the purposes of the five-year plan is to project, if you continue to make spending decisions the way you're making them, if when you're going to have to go back to the public. So we're committed to not doing that and being good fiscal stewards of our taxpayer dollars. So we have to control our um, investments and our spending moving forward. And that being the case, really then part of this five-year plan, a lot of this five-year plan also is going to have to be uh, evaluated and built on cuts or deciding not to do certain things. Repurposing the, what our spends, yes. Repurposing, not spending on something, but right. you're still looking at the same amount of dollars, So even yeah. though we have to produce some more dollars regarding the growth piece. So one of the strategies in the strategic plan is to develop a return on investment group and, and review calculation. So we're looking at every contract, um, starting with a select few, and determining, are we really getting the bank? You, it's hard to calculate a, a ROI like the corporate America does because we're not generating profit. Um, but we're trying to come up with an educational formula that comes up with, are we really getting the bank for our buck academically or operationally? Um, and so we've just started meeting. And um, we have a meeting uh, later this week or early next week, I think. And so we'll be using that work to help control and not continue to spend money because we've always done it that way. Great. That's good to, to know. And that is required, and I appreciate that. Uh, just technically, since the uh, Treasurer's report it doesn't have a complete five-year forecast. Yeah, so the version, yes. Yeah, so when they sent me the first version, it shows the one year of actual and then five years. There is a version that's got the three years of actual, and it's, I just blew it up for you. So that's can, what will get filed. Can the, uh, this will get filed? Can we just uh, then, as a revise to the treasurer's report? Yes. That this is what we're passing tonight, not yes. this. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Because we need those actuals. Thanks. Appreciate well, it. Right. They haven't changed since the last time you approved it. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. I, I believe you submitted this revision, though, didn't you? Is this what's on the revision page? This? Yes, the group okay. that does this subcontract work for us, when they sent us the first file, they took out the first two years of actuals to make it prettier to look to at. Fit the report. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's the one that got gotcha. submitted in the forecast. Okay. I mean, in the treasurer's report. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this is what we're passing. Yes. My question is um, 
the new student wellness and success funding, are these, is this the same, you know, I don't know, you know, we talk about house bills and all that. Is this the same as the wraparound dollars? It pays for wraparound services, yes, in general. It is the wraparound dollars that we it's, keep it's hearing new, about. Yes, new money no. from the governor's budget, gotcha. yes. Okay. Nope. That's, uh, people can't hear you. Thank you, President Jones. It's extra from the governor. It's not okay. wraparound dollars with another name. It's extra pot of money okay. from the governor. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on. Does anyone have any kudos? It's kudo time. Uh, Mr. Borowski. Kudo time. Uh, thank you. I have a couple kudos. Um, I went and spent some time at Dater High School with one of their science teachers, um, and it was really uh, exciting to be there. And the uh, both classes were so different. One of the classes, every student in the classroom spoke English as a second language. And seeing this teacher with an ESL teacher in the classroom sort of play off each other and just seamlessly teach as one person when there was, in fact, two people in the classroom was really, really impressive to me. So a shout out to them and to everybody at Dater High School. And then lastly, I uh, Friday afternoon ended my week last week with a FaceTime call with some kids in a Lego engineering like robotics club that came up with a way that Riverview East Academy students could continue to go to school on their floodplain and not have to relocate to the Jacobs Center um, by coming up with a means to sort of ingress and egress while water is there. And they're actually working with a real engineer on it as we speak. I don't know where that will go. All I know is it was extremely impressive um, to, see, to see that report and they were uh, unquestionably smarter than me, which is not <laughs> always difficult. So thank you. Those are my two kudos for today. <laughs> oh, thank you. Ms. Bowers. Yes, I have kudos <clears throat> to congratulate Leap Academy and Rising, uh, no, Rising Star Academy at Ezra Charles, Charles um, for their latest five-star uh, Step of the Quality rating. And for those who don't know what five-star Step of the Quality is, it's the uh, say, um, rating system by the Ohio Department of Education and the Ohio Department of Job and Families um, that measures um, national research identifying standards that um, the students or the program meets and it qualifies them for improved outcomes for children. So congratulations to Leap Academy and Rising Stars as a Charles. Thank you. Other kudos? Ms. Bolton? Just a big kudo to the uh, taxpayers and voters of the district still in my for, uh oh, okay. <laughs> well, we'll all kudo them all. Uh, remarkable, uh, I know when uh, we were all in Columbus and a number of districts were coming up and congratulating us mm -hmm. and, and saying how thankful we should be that we have such um, committed uh, voters and taxpayers in the greater Cincinnati area. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Davis, did you want to kudo Taft again? Well, no. Athletic, you might as well. Athletic Director Harden stole my kudo. <laughs> but kudos to the Senators for a fantastic year uh, and winning that playoff game, first playoff game won in our district since 1993. Great. All righty. So I thought I had a kudo, but Ms. Bolton took care of it for me, and that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> All righty, Mr. Morosky, please present the retirements you might have. I do have those. Where did I put those? Hold on. I'm not used to doing this. Where they came? Yeah, they were. Oh, they're there. Thank you, President Jones. Normally, Board Member Bates does the retirements. This is an honor that I get to do these in her stead. I was not prepared. We have no civil service retirements. We have one teacher. Daniel J. Kunkel, and a school psychologist, Joan Lichtman. Thank you for your service to the district. Thank you. Okay, we are now at the item on our agenda for hearing the public. Each speaker has three minutes to speak, and Mrs. Wagner will be our timekeeper. When the buzzer goes off, your three minutes are up. Please refrain from discussing any personnel items. When your name is called, please come to the podium to speak. And, um, I generally call them in, in three. So the first three, Marlena Brookfield, 
Rosemarie Sutton, and Jacqueline Ennis. <laughs> Good evening, board members, Good evening. Uh, superintendent, and treasurer. I am also glad that our levy renewal passed, extremely glad, uh, but I do still have lingering concerns about the financial future of CPS. Having been a regular presence here in, in board committee meetings, I've been hearing what Treasurer Wagner's been saying over and over again about our costs being forecasted to exceed our revenue, even if all existing levies are renewed. Now, I've been before you to talk about fair funding, to talk about tax abatements, how they steal our money. I need to encourage you to sit down with your city council counterparts and put together a replacement for the 99 agreement, among other things. But I'm also here tonight because of this. Uh, we were just talking about, or maybe I was thinking that Treasurer Wagner was talking about TIFs, uh, but the TIF or tax increment financing districts, there are several proposed for City of Cincinnati. Uh, it has the potential to decrease even further the funding that we get locally, and that is the largest portion of our revenue pie. So I urge you because you are tasked with making sure that we're spending our money wisely and well, to join me and other educational justice activists this Wednesday at City Hall to make our concerns known to council. They will be voting on these, I believe, in December. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sutton? Good evening, thank you for Good. letting me speak. My name is Rosemary Sutton. I'm a United States Military Academy graduate and war, war veteran. I was born and raised in Cincinnati and I returned home in 2015 to raise my family here. We live in Madisonville and I chose CPS for my son Joseph and daughter Holly and I now work at Procter & Gamble. I'm here representing the sibling children of the Cincinnati Gifted Academy at Hyde Park School who were granted acceptance to this neighborhood school because their sister or brother attended. And as, this, as of this school year, our transportation is no longer being offered to many of these sibling children to make the system, the bus system, excuse me, more efficient. I'm here speaking on behalf of five families and seven children. The Jones family, the Griner family, my own family, the Gutman family, and Miss Foster and her children. They're all either siblings of CGA students or CGA alumni. And we're requesting that the school district provide bus service to these sibling children at Hyde Park School now until the last sibling graduates in 2026. These children would not be attending Hyde Park School if it wasn't for their acceptance on the sibling ticket. The CGA students at the time were accepted from all over the city, therefore their siblings live all over the city as well. In 2017, my understanding is CGA was phased out of Hyde Park School with the last graduating class leaving this coming May. In 2017-2018 school year, um, at an evening parent information session on Spencer School that was hosted here at the central office. Um, I believe Superintendent Mitchell and at the time Principal, um, now Deputy Superintendent Ms. Amat were present. The CGA parents asked what impact these changes would have on transportation and we were told at the time that our families would be grandfathered in. Parents made long-term choices on this promise. As of today, our children, um, the siblings, that are currently enrolled need transportation for the next six years, and they're required to complete a space available request form every year at the beginning of the, of the school year. And that space availability is not granted on seat availability alone, rather if there's an existing stop within a half mile of your residence. New stops are not being added to these routes to fill the buses and offer these children transportation. In previous years, our children were grandfathered in to allow them to ride the routes, and that exception was not approved this year. There was no communication from Cincinnati Public regarding any of these changes. There was no communication before the school year to allow us to plan. No communication during the school year, and there's not been any communication other than parents following up with the district themselves. I would like to personally thank Sarah Trimble Oliver for your help to date. I appreciate the phone calls and the questions that you've answered for me. 
But in conclusion, these families just want to continue to be passionate for the district. And we want to applaud your excellent leadership and management of this diverse school system. And we ask that you please consider following through on the promises made to allow us to provide consistent schooling possible for our kids. Will you please help our children receive bus service so that they can have a stable educational experience in an excellent school? Thank you. Ms. Ennis? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I do appreciate it, Superintendent. Um, the last time I was here, no, let's start with this. I came down here to the board, well, actually, the nonprofit organization, knowtheircode.com, came down here to the board, and um, we had some questions and so forth. And we got with your communications and engagement and we sent them a question. And it was a financial question. And they said they would get back with us. They never got back with us. That was November the 1st. Also, the last time I was here, and it was spoken, I can't remember by who, but um, I did request a written response. I never received that as well. Also, knowtheircode.com is here also to talk about the licensure code of professional conduct for Ohio educators. This is the old version. There is a new version and it looks like this. It was adopted on September 17, 2019 and it was published on November 4th, 2019. It is actually approximately six pages longer than this one. And it does have some language changes. And we at knowtheircode.com 513-800-0123 want to see this in the hands of every parent, student, guardian, caregiver, and the general public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next three speakers, Alexander Olinger, Sue Mangan, we'll just start, we'll have these two and then we'll call the final three. Good evening. Please. Thank you for having me. My name is Alexandra Ollinger. I'm a Hyde Park mother. I have a son, William, who's in the fourth grade and a daughter, Audrey, who's in the second grade. We feel so grateful to be able to send our children to this public school, which is two and a half blocks from our home. When we bought our home and when our children were born, the school didn't exist. So thank you for taking a leap of faith and opening it in 2012. We have had nothing but positive experiences there, as have many of the parents, which is indicative of the growing enrollment that we have had. Um, and the enrollment and the growth with that, all of that positive success, comes some pain points as well. And we are having space issues, which is sort of near and dear to my heart, because my seven-year-old, every day, has to cross a busy intersection to, twice a day to get to a classroom that's not even in our building. It's in a commercial building um, where she attends class and then comes back over to the school at the end of the day. This obviously poses some safety concerns, but also there's time away from the classroom. Um, we love this school and we love so much how much you have supported us in, um, in this school so far. And I wanted to also just mention that this school is really about the community we have engaged members of the community who don't have children at all. We've engaged parents who have children who go elsewhere. We have engaged business, um, businesses in Hyde Park. And it's really, we're one big unit. Of the, as the years have gone by, Hyde Park School is the Hyde Park community, and Hyde Park community is the Hyde Park School. And so I just want to thank you for your support, your continued support, and the success um, that this school has been. 
Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, let's see. Um, uh, I'm here to express some concerns about the tax abatements and the tax increment financing situation. Um, City Hall seems to have lost interest in, in school funding equity. Maybe they think since we property owners just passed a 10-year renewal that we're satisfied. But I'm here to say I'm uh, not at all satisfied. Proposing 15 new TIF, TIF zones with no mention of how this will affect school funding, no explanation of how developers receiving future tax abatements will pay their fair share, and no plan for the desperately needed low-income housing for our most at-risk students leaves me very dissatisfied and disheartened. I'm here to say that City Hall is your next biggest and most urgent challenge. They've shown the public that the school district's important financial needs are not priorities on their agenda. I hope that the tax abatement issue on tonight's agenda means that there's some positive movement in that direction. However, up to now, City Hall appears to be less concerned about our schools getting a fair share from abatements given to developers. Um, they seem, um, from all accounts, ins there seems to be insu uh, insufficient work on an agreement with CPS to guarantee our district receives the share of taxes that we need. We have never rec recovered from the money we lost from the state and the federal government during the recession. Homeowners are getting tired of supplementing the profits of developers, and the school system is getting tired of getting the short end of the stick. We have to come together on this issue, and we have to come together soon and very strong. So I'm hoping that you'll consider going to city council on, on Wednesday as a group and expressing your dismay that they haven't been more forthcoming in negotiating a settlement for this tax abatement expiration. 20 years of losing money to developers is too much and we can't afford to continue in this direction. I'm looking forward to hearing where we stand on this currently in our efforts to ne negotiate an agreement. And I'm also interested in hearing your take on the creation of 15 new TIF districts and how it might affect the school system. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, our final three speakers, Matthias Knudsen, Craig Rosen, and Julie Sellers. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi, I'm Galozian Masiv. My name is Matthias Knudsen. I live in Oakley and am a sixth grader at Hyde Park School. I asked my dad if he would share my issue with you all, but he said I should stand up for myself first. So here I am. I don't really want to be here, but I think it is important to share. So maybe future students don't have the same issues. A few years ago when Spencer Center, when Spencer Center opened, I was interested in going so my brother and I could be at the same school again. As my grades were on the bubble, my dad talked to some of you and it was suggested I get my reading level stronger. We agreed to not put added pressure on myself until my confidence was higher. So thank you because I loved these, la these last three years at Hyde Park School. 
This is even with having to go across the street several times a day last year, uh, last year when my class was in the bank across the street. Over the years, I have been involved in our school with band, student council, and sports. I even helped design the new playground drum installation, which was then presented and approved by the school and neighborhood. Our playground is awesome. Thank you for helping build it. It has been nice going to a school where most of the kids live nearby. Much has changed since I went, since I went to HBS preschool, but much is still the same. I have great teachers, staff, and an awesome principal. Starting fifth grade, I decided I wanted to have options for junior high, junior high and began to work hard at improving my test scores. I think my spring test scores proved this as accelerated and advanced. My school was, my, my goal was to do well on the sixth grade fall test, on the sixth grade fall test. It could help with Walnut Spencer and other school programs. I even read a lot during the summer, especially at sleepaway camp. I really liked Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's book, Sasquatch in the Paint. It was about a kid who grew six inches over the summer and joined a basketball team, then had to juggle between brain bowl, basketball, brain bowl, and basketball. I just started his next book, Stealing the Game, and I'm also reading the Spy Camp series. I recommend them. I also did a practice test a few weeks before testing, plus the teacher helped us prepare. I felt good that I was ready to do well. So what's the problem? Well, I'm Jewish and I'm proud of my spirituality. Yet every year on major Jewish holidays, we are prevented from doing something school-related because someone determines it's okay to have these scheduling issues. As, I, as I'm sure you all know, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Passover are several of our holiest of Jewish events of the year. But every year, even though it is, not, it is now on your calendar, I miss out on stuff including testing, band, carnivals, sports, movie nights, and more. I have friends who go to other public and private schools, and they get the Jewish New Year and Day of Atonement as a day, as a day off of school. I don't know how days off are scheduled, but at the very least, could CPS stop scheduling testing and major events on these, on these holy days? Because I, because I went to services all day, I missed testing. I missed a testing day. Uh, the next day, I had to do the test. I had to do the test up, the test of that day. Then make up my missed test, which made me miss another test that I had to make up also. I was already tired from testing, frustrated that I had to squeeze in my ELA test, and my anxiety was not helping. Well, I got a score good enough to get into Walnut. I know this was far from my best, uh, far from my best effort. And I miss being identified as gifted. So I'm not sure about Spencer now. While Wana is great, I would like the Spencer option too. My brother loves it there and I love him. And I also have some friends there. My dad and I talked and he suggested I, I asked to be retested. And so hopefully that will happen. But I do not think it is great that it is right that every year in many of our schools, schedules are forcing students to choose between their religion or their school. Thank you for listening. We appreciate all you do to make our schools great. And thank you, Dad, for helping me write this. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'll just be r very brief. Uh, Matthias, I think you did a great job. Um, don't let his age and his size fool you because his quest uh, is very large. This happens every year, year in and year out. And while currently we don't uh, right now have a Jewish member on the board, uh, in the past we did, and in the future we shall. So hopefully these things will, will get resolved sooner rather than later. Um, I just want to give a big kudos uh, to the board, the staff, our community, uh, our unions, but in particular, um, President Sellers and CFT for all the hard work that they did in getting issue 12 passed on the ballot. It is a strong testament to our city and to your efforts and to our administration, our teachers, our staff, our parents, community members and partners um, that it was overwhelmingly passed with support. And so uh, I, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, lastly, um, I want to uh, congratulate Ms. Bolton 
Ms. Jones, President Jones, Ms. Bowers, on your reelection to the board, and uh, owes you off some kind words at your last uh, meeting. So, congrats. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, there is a packet that I have prepared for each one of you this evening, and um, but there are a couple of things that I would like to say before I um, get into the packet. First, I would like to really thank Josh Harden and the athletic department for all of their hard work and focus to make sure that all of the employees had their Schedule E's submitted and approved so that they will have their um, funding for the first, um, by the end of the year for the first quarter. Um, and I would also like to say that um, um, I'm glad that Mike talked about the Riverview's um, egress because that school was originally designed in the original plans to have a ramp that came across the river or across the road so that they could get into the building. And those designs were are already there, but because of funding costs and to save money, it was never built. And so if you just go back to the facilities master plan, all of that design is in that plan. Um, so, but I would like to start with the first page. And if you look at this, it is um, the CFT Newsliner from 1995. That's how long tax abatements and TIFs have been a problem for CPS. If you look, I, I was cleaning, we're moving our office, and I found this old Newsliner, and what really struck my eye was Portune seeks city help for schools. And given that this, is, this evening is a tribute to Todd Portune, and because of the school board, I did not want to um, miss this meeting to go to that, and I'm sorry I could not go, but I wanted to share this 1995 article because it's very telling that all the way back in 95, 25 years, we have been fighting this abatement issue. And if you look, there is funding that they called for, and at that time, the motion was to bring $3.7 million of services into CPS. Those services were promised to CPS, and most of them have been cut. Um, but the city needs to stop diverting school taxes to supplement their capital budget. Um, on the second page, there, the second packet, it is TIF 101 for school boards. And the article was written by the Ohio Real Estate Law Blog, and they are giving, there are a lot of Q and A's, and I think that it's really interesting that um, as you have heard, City Council has made a motion to expand 15 more areas of Cincinnati into TIF districts. This Q&A should help you to realize just how dangerous this city policy could be to the finances of CPS in the future. If you look on page three of that, you could see that there is so much more um, that could be impacted to the districts. TIF should spur new developments, but in reality, TIFs are often used to make improvements that merely impact the quality of life for the current residents. Um, TIFs apply to both commercial and residential development. With residential development, the school system may face dramatic increase in the number of students that could be going to school in those neighborhoods. And then school districts and local governments are often not defined by the same geographic boundaries, just like here in Cincinnati, which means that schools often lose money to TIFs, even though school districts Residents have no voice in the local government proposing that TIF. And school boards can and should negotiate the scope of or targets of the proposed TIFs. Some school districts, and this is where I think with our growing enrollment that we should look at as a possibility, some school districts have negotiated agreements where the TIF program includes 
financing from the local government for the construction of school facilities since we lost so many of our school facilities be due to the laws around charters that empty properties those those properties were taken from cps for pennies on the dollar and now we are growing and we don't have those properties the procedures and choices for dealing with a proposed tiff are very complex but with assistance from the right legal professional, school boards can make informed decisions that protect the best interests of the school district, the students, and the entire community of people who are paying their full share of taxes. So this is one, just one um, um, document that could be helpful. I don't think that the city should be making this decision about TIFs and a motion without an agreement with the district on how that's going to operate. Um, so CFT has been doing some research on TIFs and we found some major issues reported from other cities. The public only has until December 18th when the city, Cincinnati City Council will cast their vote to approve the administration's proposal to create, um, I don't know if it's 12 or 15 new TIF districts. But we, I want to see, there is a memo and some maps with the overlays of more information. I will email you those maps and the impact it could have. But one of the things that is really important is that the majority of the projects are for high, that we have been using, the abatements are, are for high-end housing, and it does not include enough affordable housing for our students. Um, so we want to make sure that what is being included in the TIF district policy will ensure we do not continue to create and perpetrate segregation, racial inequality, and a lack of transparency in Cincinnati's development process, which has been happening for the last 20 years. And that we want to ensure that parts of our city are truly getting the investment instead of areas already of um, affluent or gentrified areas and we want to make sure that the city plan works with CPS to build into negotiations for the impact that this these TIF districts will um, have on CPS um, there is um, the public advocates have been fighting for more equality, transparency, and accountability as it relates to tax abatements in Cincinnati for over two years. How do we make sure the use of TIFs do not just end up like our residential tax abatement program where these tools are predominantly used in wealthier parts of the city to the most wealthy and clouded political and economic interest? around the circle of power that really calls the shots on how those funds are going to be distributed and what policy can you and the city come up with to ensure that this program will be different than what we already are um, using. We want to make sure that there are specific rules regarding who makes the decisions about how and where TIFs are used and we already have many examples of how our current process has not been inclusive fair or democratic and how does the city plan to restore the foregone tax dollars meant for our schools and other public services um, we have we to ask them to wait over two decades it's not right and until after the um, tiff expires to finally receive the due share is not acceptable and so we want to make sure that however the tiff rolls out that there are guidelines, that there's a public agreement, and that it is fair to not just, it's not just CPS, it is the students and the children of this city. And we cannot allow them to take funding away that cuts programming and services for our students. We cannot go into the future saying, we don't know if we have enough money, but yet we're giving out abatements and tiffs like it's um, Halloween candy. So I just want to make sure that we don't have the abatement agreement and that now they're throwing this tiff motion in front of the abatement agreement, and I just don't understand how we can have that. But I did want you all to see this article about how Todd Portin really stood up for CPS.
Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so, moving right into our board matters topics for discussion, I think it might be just kind of a natural uh, progression just to have the discussion about where we are with the tax abatement situation now since it's come up um, several times. Um, I will say on behalf of the board that yes, this is a problem. And yes, it is a problem that here we are now faced with the new action by city council on the TIFs. And we are, uh, I think I speak collectively for the board in saying we're not happy about that. And we recognize that there's been some stalling or no movement. And so the intent of our conversation tonight is to really talk about what options we have and, and to be very concrete about how we move forward. And so, um, so uh, the first thing that I wanna do is ask Mr. Hoying to come up. Um, when we had our last meeting, we, gave, we made an assignment to uh, forward to all of city council um, copies of the PowerPoint presentation that summarized kind of what our ask was. And our ask was indeed a, a flat rate that would make the district whole. And also with that, um, we, the uh, Daniel, Mr. Hoying, the superintendent and I had a meeting at the request of Mayor Cranley who also then asked what our bottom line was. And we still held to that 33% that um, threshold. So I wanted Mr. Hoying to kind of update where we were and then we'll open up for further discussion and comment and uh, perhaps some decision about how we move forward. Mr. Hoying. Sure, so um, just to again recap, uh, we did have a meeting with the mayor uh, and city manager Dehaney. Can't on, hear you. Sorry. We had a meeting with the mayor and city manager Dehaney on the 29th. Um, generally, I think, uh, you know, a positive meeting. The, the mayor expressed interest in trying to get to a number. Uh, we shared our rationale for why 33%, which represents the, the fixed rate portion of property taxes, is the appropriate um, an additional 15, possibly 16 uh, areas of the city. Um, and we did have a representative attend uh, the city council meeting last week on that topic. Um, I think it's important to note a TIF works differently than a CRA agreement. A TIF um, or tax increment financing yeah, means that, all, you know, that no, no taxes are abated. The, the property owners or developers in those TIF districts would still pay 100% of their taxes, but the, the taxes they would pay on any increase in value don't go to the county treasurer for distribution like normal to, to all, they, they go to the city. So any new um, uh, value that's generated from new developments or, or increases in the value of those properties goes to the city and then, um, and then the city can use that TIF funding for certain uh, development projects uh, w that would benefit uh, that, that district. Um, road repairs, uh, improvements to housing, et cetera, but, but directly benefiting um, that, that TIF district and also alleviating the city from having to spend its own general funds for those same projects. Uh, the city indicated at that meeting that they intended to do this under the current 1999 agreement that's expiring, uh, that would presumably that the city would be paying 27% uh, to the school district. So that's somewhat comforting. But again, that 27% is premised on us having an annual stream of revenue from the city of $5 million to make up the difference between 27% and 33%. So 
Uh, it appears they're trying to take advantage of this agreement at the 11th hour TIF, a, a good portion of the city. There's currently only 20 TIF districts in the entire city. They've proposed to add an additional 15 uh, districts, almost 300 acres each. Okay. Okay, so we can comment from board. Mr. Morosky. And thanks, President Jones. I'll just repeat myself. Uh, I maintain that we, we ask and we get our 33%. We have a shortened agreement, 10 years, five years, and we have an annual audit to ensure that that percentage is actually continuing to make us whole. Um, and I, the way I understand it, that's kind of what was presented in the meeting you had, and we haven't heard back that that 33% number was repeated multiple times. I wouldn't say that was offered. The, 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 we, did, we certainly didn't speak for the board beyond what the board has said itself in the resolution. We've said that's, that's the board's position. Um, there was, I think, some interest on the city in coming to a number, but without a lot of the other points that were in the resolution, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Well, and I didn't agree with every single thing that was in there when we passed it either, so I've always been, I've always been focused on that 33% and that we get that and that we have an actual audit every year. The current agreement states that we will, it just doesn't really happen. So I mean like a real audit to make sure that that number, because it's going to change. And whatever it changes to, then that's what it should be so that we get made whole for the kids. Okay. Other questions or comments, Mr. Davis? Madam Chair, I believe you opened this uh, board matters piece up with the question of options. Yes. I don't see any options outside of no agreement. Uh, or 33 percent mm -hmm. and um, you know I, I rest my my soul on this this district ensuring that we're made whole and if the city cannot um, oblige at 33 percent then I then I suggest we go without an agreement I asked uh, board member Bolton if in her time the city had been any more disrespectful to the district than the, than the city is being right now. And I, and I don't take this thing personally at all because quite frankly, it's the school district of the city of Cincinnati and it's the city of Cincinnati and it's the legislators that are responsible to our citizenry. And if as a city elected official at the city, if they cannot care about our students and our families, then they don't care. And um, I've been in the community development community since 19, since 2004, I'm sorry, since 2004. And I know a little bit about community development. And, but I, I, what I know more, more importantly than about the bricks and mortar is that it's the people that make the community. And this has been so frustrating. Mm -hmm. But I will say to you also, it's quite liberating to be able to join Marlena on that side of, uh, on that side of the uh, mic, because when you sit over here, you kind of, you know, you have to watch what you say. You're, cause you're not speaking by yourself. You're speaking as a body. When I get over there where Dan at, come January after with my new hip, I'm going to bring fire to this city. And I appreciate the fire that Marlena brings, and, and I appreciate the, the wholehearted um, lessons that Julie brings, this city is being um, irresponsible, darn right negligent. It's, it's incomprehensible for them to both not want to get to an agreement and then want to add 16 TIF districts. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, at my, I'm at my wit's end. But as to your question in regard to options, I don't see any but no agreement or 33%. Uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Bolton. Yes, thank you. Um, I would agree with um, uh, members uh, Davis and, and Morosky. Um, we gave them the percentage. I think the mayor thinks that we are negotiating from that position down. That's not right. what it is. No. We don't have time for that. We are, we are instructing children we are working hard to make uh, this district the best that it possibly can be, and it's time to stop playing games with the mayor, with city council. They either care about our children or they don't. 
And we have said it's a 33%. They've disregarded everything else that was in our resolution that we arrived at publicly in front of God and everybody. And they haven't even given us the credit of even looking at that resolution. And then tell us that 33%, or that's, is that your start? No, that's where we are. And the reality is this additional TIF piece really is like salt on the wounds because you're gonna do it before this uh, agreement has uh, expired. You're also, what did you say the extra uh, additional money goes to? The, we get the regular, do that sentence yeah. or two again. Mm -hmm. So taxpayers in that district will pay the same, uh, same percentage of taxes that they, right. pay, that they would otherwise pay if they were not in a TIF district. But on, on the increase, the increase does not go to the county treasurer, it goes to the city. And then the city is able to use that TIF funding for uh, public improvement projects that they would presumably otherwise have to pay for out of their general fund. The agreement that we have is that 27% still comes to CPS, but as we've talked about, we, that, that does not make the school district whole. It doesn't make us whole because we're not having that additional money that you've Correct. talked about Currently that we've had we for the 20 years. Right. And so what this also then does is not only does it keep us from getting what would make us whole, but it then helps fill their coffers because they've been so fiscally irresponsible that they need the additional money to now pit us against the very neighborhoods we're serving because that's what they're doing. And the reality is we have to hold it 33%. I think Mr. Morawski is correct about having a shorter deal a shorter term because we don't know who we're even dealing with. And the fact that they are doing this is, as Mr. Uh, Davis has pointed out, a completely not only disrespectful to this body, but it is obviously um, ignorant of the role that public schools have played in what they like to claim credit for, which is the Cincinnati Renaissance. It started with our own facilities master plan. Yep. Ms. Ms. Bowers. Mr. Hoyne, I just have a question. So where are we at this particular state after you've already met? Where did we leave it? We're just waiting on a response from them? I, I think we're waiting on tonight. Okay. I think they've made it real clear that they aren't budging on this. They, when, when we left that meeting, um, I believe I heard, and, and Mr. Hoyne can correct me or the superintendent, I believe what I heard was uh, Mayor Cranley said he wanted to bring it to council. Okay, and I mentioned to him that we had sent council information and I think we've done our part in terms of extending ourselves to some discussion at some level so that it will lead them to a decision, but that hasn't happened. That hasn't happened. So there's been no movement on that, as a matter of fact. So um, I think we're, you know, I'm, I'm hearing the option um, stated that, you know, we, and we've always been clear that that 33% was our offer. No negotiating, and that was asked. Why are we willing to lower that? And we said no. So I think the um, uh, short-term agreement, um, the 33% flat, um, and, you know, and an annual audit, I think we, that's one of the options that I'm hearing, or no agreement. So it is, I think, what is the pleasure of the board in terms of how we move forward with this? If, if what is our next step if this is what we are agreeing to? Yes, Mr. Morosky. As much as I'm opposed to recommending this because I felt like we finally got past the, the letter stage of things. Right. Um, do we say what you just said in a formal letter from us and say, this is it? Because again, to, to Ms. Bolton's point, they haven't even addressed the resolution. Whether I like every single whereas or not, doesn't matter. It was a resolution we passed that we delivered about in public, that we agreed and disagreed about in public, in front of everybody, and they haven't even addressed it. So if we're at the point now where we're cool with these three big ticket items, let's keep it moving. I would put it in a letter and send it to him. And say, when, is, it when is their council meeting? Wednesday? They have Wednesday, what time? two. I'm sorry? Two. Okay. Um, I, I wouldn't even be beyond um, us 
drafting a statement that says exactly this, going to city council, reading it, because we get, what, two minutes or whatever? Reading it, and that's it. And then, and then whatever we need to do on our end to get the ball rolling on the decision that we made, we need to do that. But I, would, I think we need to make a statement, is what I'm saying. Sounds like, sounds like other people agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but I want to know that board members are okay with that. If, yeah. we, if we perhaps draft a statement that talks about exactly what we're saying, and it wouldn't be a bad idea for all of us to show up. Can folks show up? Can you all show up at 2 o'clock on Wednesday? I'd have to change my schedule, but I'd be willing to do it. It'd be well, 1 p.m. to sign up for hearing of the public. Is that right? 1 p.m. to sign up for hearing of the public or 1.30? 1 p.m.? Okay. It's 1, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ms. Bolton. I, I could go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say I can be there at that time. I don't know if I can be there right at 1, but I'd be able to be there. Okay. I can be there at 1 to sign us in. Yes, Ms. Bolton. I am. I think we should make a public statement. Um, I think that's good, and I think appearing there at least puts it on council members, as well as we'll find out if the mayor has shared what uh, took place in your discussion with him, with these council members. There are at least two people on that council that are, are interested in being mayor of the city. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me that anybody that wants to be mayor of this city cannot do something about this, right. let alone the other seven. I don't care if it's a 7-2 if it's a seven two vote or a 6-3 or whatever it is, but there are at least two people there that want to be mayor, and they have to care about the children. Yeah. And, and I, I, I honestly think that the letter, I mean, we, we've been nice, but I think the letter has to have some teeth, too. Um, you know, um, it, it has to really let them know and inform them, it, just in terms of impact, you know, that how, especially because of the recent decision on the tips. I think, I, I agree, it's a slap in the face kind of thing. So um, I, I think we, we should do that. Okay, so I think um, we, maybe we can talk about the letter, to draft a letter, to make a statement, the public statement, um, and if we all can be there at one o'clock, that would be great, and um, I'll sign us in, and uh, we can make a joint statement at that time. But I think, go ahead, Ms. Bolton. I would, I would like the format not necessarily to be a letter, but it's it, not a letter, it's a right. statement. It's a statement, yes. it's really, frankly, and accompanying it is a right. press release regarding these efforts. If you have to take it to the public, we really have to take it to the public. Okay. okay. Yes, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. So that's Wednesday. I just want to make sure I'm writing this down so I don't lose track of it. Okay, 1 p.m. All right, so as we move on, um, the request to rename a school. Um, this is in reference to a letter that we received from the family of uh, John Gilligan, his son and his two daughters. Um, John Gilligan, from, from what I understand, served as a board member, and Ms. Bolton is the historian on this. I'm probably going to ask you to, to comment on this, but the, we received a letter uh, back in the summer, I believe it was, with the request to um, have a school named in honor of Mr. Gilligan. And um, I met with them. Uh, Ms. Worley prepared a packet of information that I shared with them which outlined the protocol, and the board does have policy uh, um, and protocol that governs how we operate around this kind of request. Um, so we did give that to them. We gave them a list of schools that um, were not necessarily named by, uh, you know, um, uh, by, uh, of a person. 
And so, you know, there are some things clearly that they have to do, but it is a process that the board needs to facilitate and probably should go, probably should be assigned to committee for committee work. Um, so what I wanted to do as part of Board Matters is just to kind of open it up for board members if you have questions or comments about this renaming. Um, not necessarily identifying schools because we haven't identified those, we haven't identified their desired schools as yet. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments about that process. Is your hand up? Okay. Ms. Bolton? I, I think it's perfectly justifiable uh, when someone uh, has been on uh, city council, which the governor was on city council. Uh, the governor then, as many of you know, obviously became governor of the state of Ohio. He actually was not reelected in part because he did a very courageous thing, which was he put in uh, taxes so and to which some parts went to education to keep Ohio functioning. Uh, his family has a long history here, both as entrepreneurs and also uh, lawyers and, and uh, many other efforts. I think it's good of them that they did not, at least when we first talked all about this, necessarily had a, a, any particular school in, in mind. I thought that was very gracious. Uh, to begin with. I think they do, but... And, and I, that, I think that's yeah. evolved, but yeah. I also think that that's been, that evolution has taken place because of some of the supporters right. in town mm -hmm. suggesting to them. I, I think it would be, make perfect sense to, to rename a school uh, on his behalf. Um, I like to think I'm actually uh, I'm in the Gilligan chair, as far as I'm concerned, having replaced him when he retired. But um, I would also put in what I've said three or four times already publicly, which is I think many of our schools that don't necessarily or are not necessarily dedicated to any particular person or have a particular history need to be reviewed regarding their names. And I don't care if we have to pay different stationery or whatever, because one of the other issues in the naming of our schools is that there are too few schools named for women That's right. in this city. And, and really, it's like two and a half. And two of them they share with a, with a fella. So it's so obvious, considering that public education has been carried on the, on the, in the hearts of uh, women, for the most part, whether they're teachers or administrators, and certainly our history here is a feminist history in Cincinnati, I think it, this should be part of an overall review. And I, I'm supportive of the governor getting a school name for him. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No. Um, go ahead, Ms. Bauer. I agree with Board Member Bolton. Um, I think this is a good idea, talking to um, community members around um, Mr. Gilliam. I didn't know him, but I know a lot about him now. So I think it's a good idea. Okay. Mr. Moroski. I was going to second what Board Member Bolton said, and now... Um, board member Bowers, I, I missed the part about giving the community. I assumed that's what she had said. I think that's obviously smart and warranted. Um, and then we can talk about which school we'll rename Bolton Elementary later on. <laughs> okay, Mr. Davis. I, I just want to concur with other board members. Um, the Gillikin family's legacy in this town is definitely worth having a school named after and I just wanted to concur. It sounds like when we get to the assignment section, it's a two-pronged assignment. So we'll, we'll address that when we get to that. Any other questions then about that uh, particular subject? Okay, so we're gonna move quickly through the resolutions. Um, Ms. Bowers, please present the following resolution for board consideration. All right, I have a resolution approving additional students eligible for subsidy which is reimbursement in lieu of transportation. Um, I present this resolution as written. Is there a second? Any discussion? Ms. Wagner, please call the roll. Mrs. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Bolton, please present the following resolution. 
Thank you. A resolution requesting authority from the Hamilton County Budget Commission to file a modified tax budget for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. I ask for approval. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Mrs. Wagner, please call the roll. Mrs. Bolton? Aye. Ms. Bowers? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Aye. Ms. Bolton, please present the following resolution. Uh, to begin, uh, yes, a resolution to recognize November 18th through 22, uh, 2019 as Ohio Public Education Appreciation Week. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Wagner, please call the roll. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Mr. Davis, please present the following resolution. A resolution amending board policy 5722, school sponsored publications and productions. I present the, the proposal, uh, the policy as written for approval. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Quick question. Thank yes. you and a comment. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for allowing me to send this back to policy so many times. <laughs> um, just make sure it's written right. I just want to make sure, I just want to make sure so the last <laughs> sentence, according to the resolution, the last sentence will be excised in the policy. Is that right? The part about the administrators? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to double check. Right, exactly. Okay. And thank Any you, other? Mr. Hoying. Yes. Any other questions, comments? Mrs. Wagner, please call the roll. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Um, Mr. Davis, in Ms. Bates' absence, please present the following resolution. A resolution amending board policy 8650, transportation by district contract advance. Thank uh, you. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Ms. Wagner, please call the roll. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Ms. Bowers, please present our final resolution for board consideration. I have a resolution, um, the resolution amending board policy 9700, relations with organizations. Um, I submit this policy for adoption as written. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Ms. Wagner, please call the roll. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Thank you. Superintendent Mitchell, do you have a report? I do. I have a brief report. Um, as always, I like to highlight the work of our amazing students. And so on November the 1st was Cincinnati Public Schools unofficial Arbor Day. Um, we were actually um, the recipient of 150 trees that were donated by the Cincinnati Urban Forestry. Um, and the relief program. This all came through the efforts of um, board member Brian Messer. And so here is uh, pictures of, um, here are pictures of South Avondale planting their trees. Wow. So each of our schools received one to two trees. Great. Very exciting. Also in the month of October, the end of October was the fourth annual Manpower Conference for ninth through 12th grade members of our MORE program. Um, we are very excited to be able to host 194 of our students here. Um, the conference highlighted the importance of education and the impact that it has on your future. And there were several African American men who were able to reach very high levels of success um, to speak to our young people. Wonderful. Hyde Park School. Um, held their ribbon cutting for their new Vision 2020 focus, and this is their playground called Harmony Park. And so we wanted to highlight this personalized education. Um, they're also offering a wide variety of technology tools to promote 21st century skills. And last, I'd like to be able to highlight our two-day career expo. So maybe four or five years ago, we began career expos for our juniors, um, that it has expanded such that it has to be held over a two-day period. And so um, during that time, we have um, many organizations, businesses, allow our young people to come and talk with them and to get an understanding of what they do in their profession. 
And so this is for all of our 11th grade students. And that concludes my presentation that's in addition to the written report. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the revised recommendations of the superintendent? Second. Is there, a, oh, I'm sorry, discussion? Ms. Wagner, please call the roll. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Um, I will recuse on item G, but yes on the other parts of the report. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the revised report of the treasurer? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Ms. Uh, Bolton. I, I do not have a question, but again, it's the format improvement, which you did several months ago, about who's responsible. I think it would be, and maybe it's premature, but it might not be bad to be able to review the total amount of money we are voting on tonight and every night that we do this because until we start doing that, I'm, I'm not sure we're gonna give it the kind of attention that it needs. There, in this, at least before the revision, it was like $1.8 million in this one report. Mm -hmm. And so uh, also from a standpoint of Finance department, uh, we delaying the contract review that we use the annual one because we had a request for doing that. This, these contracts, as you mentioned properly in your uh, five-year forecast, all of these contracts. It's not just the master contract for collective bargaining. It's all of this. It's just a million here and a million there, and it gets to be money that we're going to need to do other things. So glad to hear that, but. 1.8 that I know of in this tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Wagner, please call the roll. Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mrs. Bowers? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Jones? Yes. Thank you. Inquiries and updates. Um, very brief. Um, Ms. Worley? Can you please um, give us an update? Uh, I, we posted on our website a um, very important message about forums that we're hosting around the changes in Metro, and I asked Ms. Worley to give us an update on that. Yes, my colleague Lauren Johnson is here too to answer any questions from last, last week's Ms. Bowers. I understand you were there. Um, for those, just to bring everyone up to speed, as part of the, the Metro's Fast Stops initiative, they're looking at removing several hundred uh, metro stops. The first phase of that uh, coincidentally started the first day of school for us, and the second phase begins on December 1st, which is the day before our first day back after Thanksgiving. There'll be about 400 metro stops that will be eliminated at that time, um, some of which our kids may use. And the, and the trick for us is, as you all know, we don't always know what stops our kids use because they may have different stops along the route that they may so choose to use. Um, so, so far we've been working very diligently to get a hold of kids as well as parents about these changes. Um, Metro has offered and has hosted so far the first and second ones tonight uh, of four forums at our schools. Tonight they're at Walnut Hills. Later this week they'll be at um, Clark and Western Hills. Last week we were at Gamble. Um, we also have that information front and center on the CPS website. It's also on all the high school websites. A parent email went out last week. There'll be posters and electronic board announcements in the hallways uh, for kids to know. We're also hoping to partner more with our friends over at the Better Bus Coalition to look for other ways we can get a hold of people. This is the type of thing most people don't pay attention to until they show up at the bus stop that day and their bus isn't there. Um, so. All creative ideas are welcome uh, on this one, including word of mouth. Uh, and will we continue to work on um, earned media and other pieces of content to make sure people are aware? Thank you. Okay, um, as you all know, if you've checked out the board calendar, um, we are scheduled, our, or our first meeting of, the month of January will be our organizational meeting, um, which is the sixth. And it's also our first board meeting. Um, 
And then the January 11th, which is the Saturday following, is our board work session. So I wanted to put out there, if, if you start thinking about um, what you want to see on the board work session agenda, which we're not going to cancel unless we have 15 inches of snow, I promise you, <laughs> okay? But um, please start giving your thoughts and ideas uh, and suggestions to Phyllis, who will keep a running um, tab on, on our ideas, and, and we'll make sure we get the agenda formulated in enough time so that you can review it. Um, and make final changes. So that's going to be January 11th. And then the organizational meeting on January 6th, you can expect to get your organizational chart. Um, we were hoping to get it out the latter part of November. Our protocols say it's supposed to be out by the end of November. So uh, we should get that. I would, we had a conversation back a few meetings ago, probably more than a few meetings, about making sure that if there are committees on, on which board members serve, just so we get a, a well-rounded understanding of what work people are doing, and it may not be listed on that organizational structure, if you, the suggestion is to put it on there so we at least know who's serving on what committee in the community. So that would be helpful. And, and, um, you can also give that information to Phyllis, so make sure that when it comes out, we'll know what those committees are. Okay? All right. Any other um, inquiries and updates? Yes. I have uh, one update, and it's really directed toward the administration, uh, it's, and but it's not an assignment. Um, I, several of us were uh, happy to go to the OSBA conference, one of the many learning sessions, and there's hundreds of them, one of them uh, was highlighting, if you will, remodeling and uh, building uh, in both Urbana and most particularly Middletown districts, where they were in full, um, how shall I say, full charging mode of looking at what schools actually need to look like now instead of necessarily what schools always have looked like. The, and, and when we saw some of the additions uh, that were given to us on the work session, it still looked like we were making some boxes uh, that were called classrooms. Uh, I was absolutely fascinated. I mean, we lead the state in, in all this kind of work, but these folks uh, have taken the next gen, if you will, the next generation, and I would really encourage all of us to have the opportunity to see it. We'll try to get some uh, visual uh, images for you for both Middletown and Urbana, but um, I'm, I'm thinking of actually going and visiting some of these new uh, additions and brand new schools and remodels. Very interesting, a lot of UDL, a lot of that whole piece of you know universal design, but thinking of workspaces that flow out from the classroom, all kinds of stuff that can actually save you space as you build, and since we're gonna be faced with that. But they'd love, for, of course, Middletown particularly would really love to be able to show Cincinnati folks uh, how to do it. <laughs> so those middies, you know them. So uh, there, it was a great update, great great conference too. I think we all had it was a, a good one time. of the better ones yes. they've had. I was getting a little bored with, with it, <laughs> yeah. but this year was pretty good, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other um, updates? Okay, assignments. Yes, Mr. Morosky. I have uh, two. Um, uh, so there are the two House bills, and I sent the members of the board updates on both of these, and Mr. Hoying and uh, Dan got some info back to me. Um, I would like to, and I'm kind of uncertain where this would fall. I can draft something up for Phyllis or Pat, but I would like us to take a formal stance in opposition to House Bill 164, which passed out of the House quite sing by quite a margin. And I know there's some folks on this body that think it'll die, and I have some friends in the House that think it'll die, but the Senate is as conservative as, as the House is. And for those who don't know, House Bill 164 is the Religious Protections Bill <clears throat> that sounds nice on the surface, but would do things such as require public school. It's only public schools, because these people don't have any say over the schools they send their kids to. I know that's a broad brush, but um, it's largely true. 
require public school teachers to say, for example, count creationist beliefs as correct on science tests. Um, there's a difference between religious protections like Mr. Um, Matthias was talking about and um, wrong things. And so I really think we should take a firm stance on it. The ACLU has, so it's House Bill 164. I, I'd like the board to consider um, taking a firm stance of opposition via resolution to the bill and send a letter to the legislature. Um, so I don't know where that lies. Who's that? If I'm assigning it to myself, uh, um, Madam which is Chair, fine. I think, yes, Ms. Bolton. I think Mrs. Bates had suggested it go to finance largely because the liaison people are there. <laughs> the question is, though, it has to then come out of finance and be ready for work by the board. If the board has a consensus already, I'm not sure that it has to go to another and committee. I, and, and I was told, oh, sorry. So, uh, but but uh, that's only because the liaison were there, and I w she wanted me to mention that. I know. But uh, I think it's been asked and not answered by them uh, already. But uh, it would it would it needs some work before the board can, unless we do it tonight, say write a letter. And to that. Yes, Mr. And Ms. Bates, Ms. Bates had said that to me, um, and I did that at the beginning of the summertime when this was first mm -hmm. mentioned, and nothing ever happened. Right. from our government liaisons, and it never came back to us. So and this, is, this, is a, this would really disrupt the, uh, our teachers' pedagogy if they were to have to count things like creationist beliefs is right. I mean, to say nothing of ruining a child's education, because those are lies. And we believe in facts at CPS, and I think in this day and age, when facts don't matter so much, it would send a strong message if this elected body took a stand and said, at CPS, we believe in facts. Yes. Um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm also looking at Mr. Hoying, um, do we need a first reading of a resolution if he's presenting it tonight, or can we proceed to a written resolution? Is there a resolution? No, no, there's no resolution. No, there's tonight. no resolution no. tonight. But maybe if it's not a resolution and instead a letter, that wouldn't require by our protocol that we have a discussion or that it come from committee right. if it's a letter from the board. Okay. In opposition to right. the chair, I believe it would be education, which maybe, well, I don't know if it's Senator Blessing because he was in the House and now he's in the Senate, but I believe it would be in the Education Committee. Okay. Yeah, so, with a so, CC of all the members. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say then is the suggestion is to write a letter of opposition mm -hmm. that we can just send to. Them. Well, and register it as opponent testimony when they hear it and request that it be read aloud, unless one of us, like, wants to go up there, which I would volunteer myself to do. Okay. Enter it into the record, yeah. either okay. orally yeah. or by Because you have to record. fill out the witness slip, even if you're not there, to have the letter read. I'm not talking. I don't want it sent to these people and have it sit on their desk. I want it read at yes. committee. Yes, gotcha. Okay. Is, and we, we need to just see the letter. Yeah. Before, yeah, yeah, of course. All right. I think, I think Mr. Hoyne should probably write the letter with yeah. Mr. Uh, Morosky's help. Well, I would, you know, I can, I can help. <laughs> I, I was an English teacher. Okay. Um, and then uh, just the last thing, I guess this could have been more an inquiry or update. Um, I don't think it's maybe at the position to, like, log proponent testimony, but House Bill 360 is really interesting that Rep. Erica Crawley out of Columbus has introduced that would require new builds, new builds, new schools to have water bottle filling stations. As we talk about the future schools and what they look like, water fountains got to go. And I see a day where every kid on day one gets a branded water bottle of their school, and here's your water bottle. And there's so all kinds of good come from this. So it, it wouldn't require any retrofitting. It would only be for new builds, which, I, to, to Ms. Bolton's point, hopefully when we look in the future, we're not looking at sitting kids in these rows in these boxes with right. these water fountains. It's over. They have water bottle filling stations. They have places they can congregate, high top tables, whatever. So okay. that's all. I guess that was more of an update. Okay. Thank you. Any other assignments? Um, I believe we had two regarding the renaming. One assignment, um, I will make an assignment to Student Achievement to work with the Gilligan family on the process of renaming. I believe that goes to Student Achievement. Um, to work directly with the Gilligan family, which means, um, I think we got the letter, but the, the letter that I received, I will make sure that you get it, Ms. Fulton. Okay, and then the second part of that is um, also an assignment to um, 
I don't know if that should be policy or student achievement. You all can help me with this. To relook the process, you were talking about the fact that uh, our schools are predominantly named by women and, uh, I'm sorry, men, and we, we needed to relook the process. Is that a policy issue or? Okay, so I'll make that assignment to um, policy committee. And then my final assignment is board, to board members. Make sure we show up on Wednesday, one o'clock. And, and I'm gonna ask our admin, um, Ms. Davis, to make sure that Mr. Messer and Ms. Bates are informed of that meeting to come. Okay, any other assignments before I do the gavel? Okay. Having no other business before us, I declare the meeting adjourned. This is a long, oops.